I, uh, I think that it's probably the case with most people that there are, um, there are things in their past which they regret. Maybe it's true for you that there are things in your past that maybe are, you know, a little embarrassing. And thankfully for most people, those things that we look into the past and we have regret about, we only have to be reminded about them every 10 years at high school reunions when somebody pulls out that yearbook and says, look at his afro, right? Why on earth did this dude have, why would, you know, would Rusty grow an afro? I don't know that Rusty actually had, did you have an afro? Mullet, there we go. Northeast Texas, there you go. Um, yeah, we, we all had our mullet back in the day. Um, and so, you know, there's always this sort of regrettable kind of things, maybe kind of cringeworthy aspects of our history. And uh, one of those things that was uh, cringeworthy in my past came to revisit me uh, one night. Haley and I were working at a restaurant in Texarkana, the town where we both grew up, and Haley was working as a hostess, I was working as a server, and she seated, as happens, you know, as it would happen, she seated this group of people in my section, and so she, you know, leads them to my section, I meet them at the table, and begin my, you know, typical introduction, little spiel, hi, I'm Chip, I'll be your server this evening, can I tell you about our specials, right, and I'll just work through the menu items that were different that night, which they were never different. It was always the same sort of things over and over. And so I'd go through the special or whatever, and I got it so far as to say, hi, my name's Chip. I'll be your server this evening. When one of the young ladies that my wife was seating, Haley was handing her a menu, and she looked at me, and she said, Chip, by, by chance did you used to go to the skating rink a lot? I said, uh, yes. I, I did. Well, as it happened, my dad and mom owned a skating rink for a period of my childhood. And so by, did you go to the skating rink a lot? I was there pretty much all the time. From the time the doors opened until they closed, I was there. I was, you know, like five or six years old. I was checking out skates. I learned how to fix the trucks when I was probably eight years old. Like I was, like, I lived at the skating rink. And she said, you were there a lot, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, I was. And she said, and you had, you have like three older sisters, which is true. And at this point, I knew where this was going. And so I just really wanted to wrap this conversation up, you know, quickly. And so I was just like, yes, I do. And they're all doing well. Now, can I tell you about our menu? And she said, hold on. I'm rem I think I'm remembering this correctly. And at this point, I'm thinking if only Haley could go away just just go away somewhere else like I, you know i was wishing that like i could like throw a ball or you know anything or just that i could disappear just that like i could like you know do this and just pff, gone that did not happen for me as this woman continued she said you had older sisters and it's true i have three older sisters now here's the thing about growing up in a skating rink is that um we would every saturday the place would be packed with you know kids and we would do a lot of different activities um one of which was the hokey pokey which is a custom of my people where you put your left foot in and then your left foot out and in and you shake it Thank you. You've been there. You know. Um, and so I would do the hokey pokey just like everyone else. And then there would be races. And we'd have races by different age groups. And I wanted to be a, a, a racer. Like I wanted to be able to just like, you know, burn around the, you know, the rink. And I wasn't. I was not a racer. I was too pudgy and not able to move fast enough to ever win a race. There was one area, though, that I really excelled at that I did not want to excel at because as I mentioned, I have three older sisters and they had no interest in skating fast. They wanted to skate beautifully. My sisters all wanted to be skate dancers. And you're th maybe thinking that can't be a thing. It is. It is definitely a thing. And my sisters wanted to be skate dancers. And to be a skate dancer, you really had to dance in couples. And some of you have already done the math. And you've said, with 
three sisters, that means there's one couple, and then there's one sister that needs a partner. And so virtually every day of my childhood, I was forced, against my will, to skate dance. And when I was 26 years old working at a Mexican restaurant, standing next to my wife, this woman said to me, she said, I remember you. And she looked at my wife and said, your husband is a beautiful skate dancer. She looked back at me and said, every time I go skating, I think about you. Which was one of the most disturbing things I had ever heard to that point in my life. Because if she goes often, then she's thinking about me a lot, and I don't, I'm not really, a, you know, a fan of that. And it, if she's only going occasionally, it's like, is that a big, th- I, you know, it just, I felt really kind of creeped out. And my wife, I wanted to be equally creeped out, and she was not. She was intrigued, because she realized that I was embarrassed. And she said, tell me more about his skate dancing. She made a friend that night. And I discovered how embarrassed I could be. Um, I tell you that story because, well, I wanted to beat my wife to the punch of telling you herself. Uh, Just kind of get out ahead of it. But also, I I tell it because I think it exemplifies something about remembering. This woman, she remembered me skate dancing. And I remembered skate dancing. I remember it all too well. Um... But I, this may be hard for you to believe, I don't skate dance anymore. I gasp. <gasps> I, I don't. I, I just kind of you know, let that area of my life fade away as quickly as possible. And I have not even tried to skate dance in a number of years. And the only condition under which I would ever attempt to skate dance again is if I was absolutely alone in a skating rink. And like there was no one there and no recording equipment, then I might would uh, no even then I wouldn't give it a try. I have it's behind me, and that's the thing about remembering. When the Greeks talk about remembering, when Jesus, speaking Greek, talked about remembering or remembrance, it carries with it two different ideas. One is that we remember a thing that happened, just like I can remember skate dancing the second is to remember a skill or a practice and i don't remember how to skate dance there's two different aspects there one is this idea that we can remember an event we remember a story we remember something that happened and the other is that we remember a skill or a a practice We're going to look at a passage of scripture today. Now, we've been talking about these meals that Jesus shared with people and how he used these meals as an opportunity to share not just food, but to share the gospel, to share what uh, the picture of the good news uh, that God had for humanity was. And he took an opportunity at numerous meals across his ministry to make that happen. And I think maybe the clearest, one of the clearest pictures we get of that grace is, is in Luke chapter 22. And it is the celebration of the Passover. See, Jesus gathered together with his disciples for one last meal before the crucifixion. And this is how it went down. Now, you can see this story in a couple of other places, and in each place there's a few details that are added here or left out here, but I want to share it from Luke chapter 22 this morning. And this is, this is what the scripture said. And I'm going to read verses 14 through 20. And, and I don't do this every time we read the scriptures together, but I'm going to be reading this entire passage all at once. So would you stand with me for the reading of God's word this morning? Luke 22, verses 14 through 20 says this. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You may be seated. Jesus is here in this moment, and he tells them to do this as often as they do it in remembrance. In remembrance. The Greek word is anonymsis, which is where we get the word amnesia from, which is to forget something forever. Not just to forget it momentarily, but to forget it and to keep on forgetting it. And when Jesus says to do this in remembrance, it is to do it and to keep on doing it. To remember it and to keep on remembering it. Not just as a historical fact, but also as a practice, as a skill, as something that we do again and again and again so that our memory of it is constantly reminded that it's constantly brought back to the fore of our thoughts why we remember and we remember in not just in why we remember but this is how we remember it and that's what he was doing that night was he was doing something in remembrance he was remembering the passover and so i want tonight uh, this morning i want to talk a little bit about the passover and this supper that he shared with the apostles and i want to really organize our thoughts around four different things that are are really made clear in celebrating the lord's supper four different things that we should remember every time we celebrate it the first is as we celebrate the lord's supper as we take this bread and this cup together we should remember god's plan now the original plan we see in exodus chapter 12 that's where the story of the passover takes place all right and the passover happens at the end of these plagues it's the last of these plagues of egypt you may have seen a movie about this they've made a bunch of them it seems like i mean like there's the live action charlton heston version you know where he's just like big and glorious let my people go and then there's even the cartoon versions to celebrate with the kids why hollywood hasn't made more movies about the old testament i don't know why they keep doing that one again and again i'm not really sure i think ehud and the judges would be a great story probably couldn't make a cartoon out of it but it's there and this is the end of it The last of the plagues is this Passover, and God prepares his people for the Passover, and he tells them to do this in preparation, to take a lamb, to sacrifice it, to separate the blood of the lamb from the body, then to use that blood to to mark the doorposts, the surrounding of the doors of their homes, and then to take that lamb, to break its body, and to eat it together, to eat the lamb with bread that was made in a very specific way without leavening so it would not have to wait to rise so they would eat eat unleavened bread lamb and they would drink wine and these three elements were sort of the essential elements for the passover meal in the original passover meal and how they celebrated it every year after and this was how they celebrated the, the lamb the unleavened bread and the wine and they would celebrate it year after year on the Passover, and they would do it to remember what God did on that first Passover. And what God did on that first Passover was to send an angel of the Lord to go and to sacrifice the firstborn among Egypt. But the, but the children of Israel were spared because they were found to be under the blood of the Lamb. And in Jesus here, he says that how long he has waited to eat this together. And this has been his plan but notice something that's missing from their Passover celebration. He says there, there's bread, there's wine. But they don't eat a lamb that day. And the reason for that is that Jesus was the sacrificial lamb. Jesus was the, the true sacrificial lamb. All the other lambs that had been shed from that point backwards to the first, they were all a picture. They were all an idea of what Jesus would ultimately fulfill. Because Jesus was the lamb who was slain from the foundations of the world. He was the, the lamb whose blood would be poured out and would lead to our freedom, 
that would lead to our salvation. He was the one whose body would be broken on our behalf. And he says, as often as you eat it, as often as you eat it together, do this in remembrance of me. You see, this was his plan. This was his plan all along. From the very first Passover, this was the plan. Further back. Before the children of Israel ever went into slavery, this was his plan. Before Adam and Eve ever fell into sin, this was the plan. Before God had first said, let there be light, this was the plan in his mind. The sinful nature of man, the fallen nature of man, that these things didn't surprise God. This wasn't a plan B. This wasn't a, well, this first thing didn't work out, so let's brainstorm a little bit, Trinity. Let's brainstorm a little bit, Trinity. Let's see if we can come up with something new or different or better. This was always the plan. God always had this in mind, and this happened according to his plan, that his disciples would be brought together and that they would celebrate and that Jesus would ordain, that Jesus would initiate what we're going to celebrate today. Because this was always his plan also. It was his plan for us to gather here together today. Before, before we made any announcements that we'd be having the Lord's Supper today, before we all went out to the store to pick out masks, before we made plans we made plans. He made a plan that we would be here together today to remember. And the th first thing that we need to remember is that God has a plan. That God has a plan and that things are happening according to his plan. And sometimes we don't understand his plan. Sometimes we may not even like his plan. But it's his plan. And we should be able to rest in the assurance that his plan is, I say good, because it's good in that it's, it's not wicked, but also that it's best. That his plan is best. That if we were to go according to our plans, we would mess up everything. We would. But God, his plan is superior. His plan is perfect. And so as we take this cup together, as we eat this bread, let's remember God's plan for us. Second, I would say that we need to remember God's providence, that God is providing for us, and he always has. I love the story of the Exodus. In fact, in chapter 16, it describes sort of what happens after the Passover, what's, what's coming, what's what following right this is the scene in the movie where charlton heston sort of leads this parade to the red sea right and and all the children of israel are moving to the red sea and and then they're like well there's a giant body of water in front of us and moses raises his staff and the waters part and the children of israel go across on dry land and then pharaoh's army is coming to and, and they're coming and they're into the water and then the waters crash down around them their chariots get bogged up in the water and his army is destroyed by water and then the children of israel find themselves in a deserted place in a place where there's not a, a store, where there's no goods to buy, and they're hungry, and they, well, they, they kind of lose it. They start complaining, and not just a little bit, they start complaining big time. Like, they're, they're complaining like, you know, a four-year-old on a 10-hour road trip. Like, they're really, really complaining. They really need to go to the bathroom, and if you don't stop, you know, that kind of complaining. They're really complaining. And, and God sends them manna. He sends them bread that just appears out of the ether. And, of course, later on they'll find a reason to complain about that too. But through all of it, through all of the things, all of the traveling, all of the complaining, all of the infighting, God provided again and again and again jesus provided jesus provided for his his apostles 
He provided for his apostles. In fact, verse 35, he makes reference to a time when he sent them out, when he sent them out with uh, the gospel message. And he says, I sent you out with nothing. You didn't take a bag. You didn't take you know, an extra cloak. You didn't take anything. I sent you out. Did you lack for anything? And the, the, the disciples say, no, we didn't lack for anything. And he says, I'm sending you out again. I'm sending you out again. But you can go ahead and take your bag. You can take your purse. You can take your stuff. You can take a coat. You can take a sword. In fact, if you don't have a sword, go ahead and sell a coat and buy a sword. Because he's saying, listen, I'm sending you out again. And the road's going to be hard, but understand, you're not going to lack for anything. Because the same Jesus that provided for them before is providing for them again. The same God that provided for the children of Israel when they needed a way across a sea. The same God who provided a way to be free from slavery. The same God who provided safety from an army. And the same God who provided manna from the sky. The same God's providing. He provided for the apostles then. He provides for us now. We come together today to eat together, and in this act, we should remember God's providence. We should remember how good this world of ours is, how fortunate, how blessed we are. I love that we celebrate, we celebrate the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord with food. And great, it's not a lot of food. And I don't want to spoil this for you, but it's not even very good. It's not. In fact, that bread's been out there for a long time. And just when you thought that the communion wafer couldn't get any more stale, leave it out for a couple of days. That'll really, yeah. Um, it's going to be stale. It's going to feel like you're just eating sand, I imagine. Um, and yet, how good it is that we live in a country that has bread. How good it is that, that people who are home today who couldn't be with us, that we not only could deliver them bread and, and grape juice, we could give them special, hermetically sealed, individual cups of bread and juice. How blessed are we that we have the ability to do that? How blessed are we that we have food? Because this, you know, we talk, Jesus, he just, and, you know, when the people ask him, Lord, teach us to pray, he says, give us this day our daily bread. And I think a lot of times we over-spiritualize that. We make that really spiritual. Oh, Jesus is the bread of life. The word is the bread. We make a lot of things the bread. But it doesn't have to be. In fact, it is an amazing blessing of God just that we have bread. Look to history. Look to the world wars. Look to the wars that our world has fought across the past millennia. And you'll see that the leading cause of death is not bullets, it is not bombs, it is not swords. It's hunger and infection. Look at World War II. The aftermath of, of World War II left millions starving. So when we eat this bread, we thank God for it. Because we have it. Because God has provided it. He has given us sunshine and rain in perfect measure for the wheat to grow. He's given us these things in perfect measure so that we could grow crops. He's given us time to harvest those crops. He's given us a network of distribution to send those products to places, to be put in ovens, to bake, to be delivered to us so that we can kind of enjoy this together he's done all of that and if if he's done all of that and he's continued to do all of that for the entirety of our relationship as humanity to our god if he's done that for the past thousands of years won't he be faithful to continue that or do we think that god's character has changed our character sometimes changes. We can go through, we can suffer events that, that change the way we look at the world. God doesn't. God's character hasn't changed. 2020 hasn't hit God so hard that he's like, oh, I'm just done with this. It hasn't. 
And 2021 is not going to have any punches that God isn't ready for either. Because God has a plan. And for us, God provides. So as we take this cup and this bread, let's remember his provision. The third thing that we should remember as we celebrate this meal together is we should remember his promise. We should remember his promise in Exodus 19. He gathers the people together and he says to them, if you will obey my voice and keep this covenant, you will be my treasured possession. You will be my treasured possession. I love that song that we sang today. You say, I am loved. You say, I am loved even when I can't feel a thing. How wonderful it is to know that we have a God to whom we are a treasured possession. That he sees in us more value than we see in ourselves. We should remember his promise that says, you will be my people. Now, the promise that he gave in Exodus 19 was a conditional one. It was a conditional one. It was a covenant, and it was a covenant built on behavior. And when I say covenant, that's contract. Just like you and I would have a contract with our mortgage company where they provide money and you provide the rest of your life for paying that money back, right? It's, it's a contract. But it's, it's, a, it's not a contract between equals. It's a contract with one far inferior, one far superior. And the contract is sort of, sort of like this in that God gave us a contract, and he says, do the work that I give to you, and I'll provide you with the things that you need. And that was the contract, that was the covenant, that was the promise that he gave, and they never kept it. The children of Israel never kept it. They they tried. Some people really tried. Some people really didn't, but none of them could actually keep it. Now, imagine... Imagine that a contractor came to your house to say that they would do work. And then you paid them for the work, and then they didn't do the work. And some of you say, I don't have to imagine what that is like. I just have to remember what that is like. But imagine that, that someone, someone did that. That they said, they'll do the work, you pay the price for the work to be done. They don't deliver on their end of the contract And so what does it leave you to do? Well, if you don't have any more money, then it leaves you to do the work yourself. And so instead of the roofers coming and fixing your roof, they just take your money, they disappear, and then you're up nailing on shingles yourself. This would make us all angry. This would make us all really, really frustrated. And yet, that is what God did for us. Recognizing that we could not keep the covenant, recognizing that we would never be able to keep the covenant, that our side of the contract would always be void, recognizing that he decided to get up on the roof and do it himself. He decided that he would do, not only that he would pay the price for it, but that he would do the work for it. And that was where the promise is fulfilled in Jesus. Because Jesus keeps both sides of that contract with us. He keeps both sides in that he He not only gives us life, but he paid the price for it. He not only holds us as a treasured possession, but he paid a dear price to keep us as his treasured possession. And he sets that on us. He sets that on us. He puts that on our shoulders to still to try and remember his promise and to take that promise and share it with other people to take that promise of of life to take that covenant that new covenant in his blood and say friend you don't have to be perfect friend you've broken the ten commandments so have i because the most shameful thing in my past and in your past isn't skate dancing it's sin and it's there it's there and If we're real honest, it's not just in our past. Our sin isn't something that we have to have a really good memory to remember. We can probably just remember this morning. 
And we remember that. We remember the promise that was fulfilled in Jesus. A promise that is still being fulfilled in people's lives today. And as we take this cup and as we, as we take this bread, we remember that promise. We hold to it. Dear church, will you, will you cling to that promise? Will you hold on to it desperately? Will you, will you share that promise with people who need it? As we take this Lord's Supper, we remember His plan and we remember His promise. We remember His providence, but also we celebrate His presence. In Exodus 24, we have this really amazing uh, picture of God's presence with His people. He's already told them, if you keep the covenant, you'll be my treasured possession. They've already failed at this point. And yet, in Exodus 24, God calls Moses to take 70 elders with him onto the mountain and God says that I will meet you there. And God comes to the mountain in this, this cloud, in this form that consumes the top of the mountain in what the people would describe as it looks like it's being consumed by fire. I, I don't know what kind of cloud that is. I don't know if it was just one giant fireball that continued to burn for 40 days. I don't know if it was a, a, a thunderhead that just sat over the mountaintop and flashed lightning all around it for 40 days. But I know this, that, that Moses was called into the presence of God, that the people saw the presence of God on the top of that mountain for 40 days. And he was present with them. And it was a cause for celebration. And Jesus, Jesus says to his disciples, right from the jump, he says, I have eagerly desired to eat this with you. He says, I, I want to be in your presence. I want to be with you. He says, but, but I won't be able to be with you the way that I want to until... My kingdom comes. But they're promised a seat with him when that kingdom comes. And he says that we do this in remembrance. And we do this in remembrance not in the way that we remember something that happened in the past. But we do it as a practice. We do it as a practice. We do it as a, as a skill to come together to be disciplined about coming together to celebrate his presence. Now, we practice the Lord's Supper in a, um, in a sober way, but we shouldn't practice it in a somber way. We should practice this in seriousness, deliberately, but not mournfully. There's... There's no occasion here to mourn because I know, I know that I know what happens in the next couple of chapters of the text. I know that Jesus would be betrayed. I know that he would. I know that he's going to be betrayed, that he's going to be handed over to the authorities, that he's going to be beaten, he's going to be stripped, he's going to be murdered. I know that. But the gathering together is not a celebration of just his suffering but it's a celebration of the life that follows the suffering we celebrate not his absence we celebrate his presence because he is here today with us in a very real way not just not just the way that we had to, well, i'll just say this a couple of months ago we had a dog named Patty. She was just the worst dog. She was really horrible. Any of you who live in my neighborhood, you saw us constantly looking for Patty. Never has a dog wanted to be away from his family or her family as much as Patty wanted to lose us. At every opportunity, when there was just the slightest gap in a door or window, that dog shot through it looking for an exit. And eventually, she found it, and I don't know where Patty is. One of you may have Patty. If you do, keep her. Keep her. Now, 
we have told our kids that, you know, we don't know where Patty is, and, and especially the youngest, he took it kind of hard, and he'll still sometimes say, I miss Patty. And we'll say things like, oh, baby, but, but Patty's still with us in our hearts. That's junk. That's junk. Patty's not with us. She's with some other family that she hopefully likes more than us. She chose that, guys. She chose to not be with us. That's not how we celebrate the Lord today. We don't say, he's still with us in, his, in our hearts because we have all these, this history. We have all these stories. It's not that. This is not a pretend celebration. It is that we celebrate because the Lord is, is not just near, the Lord is here with us today. That as we gather together, as we take these elements, that there is something here that he says he wants to be with his people. That, that is his presence. And it is a present reality, and it is worth celebrating. So today, I, I pray that you will take this cup, that you will take this bread, and that you'll do it in a manner that is worthy. The scriptures tell us that, that as we celebrate his presence, we don't want to do that in a way that is unworthy. We don't want to do that in a way that does not honor God. We don't want to do it in a way that only fulfills our needs or only recognizes ourselves. We want to do this as an act of worship. And so... I'd like to do that right now. I'm going to come here with my family, as hopefully you are gathered with your near ones. If you will, everyone, take one of these little cups with the wafer in it. We would encourage everyone here who is a baptized believer to take this with us. And as we remember his plan, his providence, his promise, let us remember that he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you will take your cups. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let's pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have always had a plan for us. We thank you that you sent your Son to bleed and die for us. Lord, we could never be worthy of that broken body Lord, we look to ourselves and, and we know that if it was up to us that our salvation would be lost. But Lord, we lean into you. We rest on your goodness. Lord, we thank you for being so good to us. We thank you for the way that your love was made manifest in the life and, and death and resurrection of Jesus. Lord, I pray that if there is any here today that doesn't know you, 
that today would be a day of, of discovery for them, that today they could learn of a heavenly father who loved them so much to give his only begotten son to die for them. Lord, if there's any here today who maybe felt, maybe felt conflict in taking the cup, maybe there's some issue of, of sin, or lack of repentance that, that made the spirit in them turn just a little bit. Lord, I pray that, that your spirit would work in their hearts, that they could be reconciled to you. Lord, I pray that that you would bless each of these families here. Lord, this has been a, a very trying season for us. To you, it's maybe felt like the blink of an eye, but for us, it's felt like a long, long year. Lord, I pray that you would give us comfort, that you would give those who are troubled peace, that you would be with those who are mourning, that you would dry their tears. Lord, I thank you that we could gather here together today. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will, stand with us as we sing. We'll have this word. If there's a decision that needs to be made, if there's a conversation that we need to have, I'll be here. I'd love to talk to you about the plan that the Heavenly Father has for you and your family. If there's something that you need to make right in your own heart, I pray that you'll take this time as a time of quiet reflection.